Hey everyone, welcome. I, I'm Ken Goldberg and I, am, I want to say on behalf of the Berkeley Center for New Media and the Berkeley Arts and Design Monday series, and in particular, I want to thank our directors, uh, Shannon Jackson and Nicholas DiMonchaw for, uh, for, for coordinating, and um, all of the wonderful staff and, uh, and faculty who are involved in this program. I want to just off the top say that we have a great um, talk that's going to happen next Monday here. It's with Nnedi Okorafor. She's a, 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 an African science fiction writer, and um, it should be fantastic. That's, um, that's right here in the same time, same place. And I it's a pleasure to welcome you here to the 22nd year of the Art, Technology, and Culture series and to the 204th time that we've gotten together to discuss and debate ideas. Uh, it's also an honor for me to announce to you our theme for our next year's series. And <laughs> it's a, uh, I know you're excited too. It's, uh, it's, it's next year, 2020 is the 100th anniversary of a word that's been adopted by people around the world and is very dear to my heart. The word is robot. So, yes, it was coined in 1920 by the uh, Czech playwright Karl Čepek and uh, has a complex history. In fact, um, I like what Oliver Morton recently wrote in The Economist. He said that robots are the new immigrants. Um, not, not, not from a distant land, but from the future. And I think there's a lot of uh, nuance and subtlety to that. In fact, um, more, more, Oliver Morton pointed out that a lot of the early uh, writers and filmmakers and scientists working with robots were, in fact, immigrants. And that there's, some, there's, there's a really complex nuance to that idea um, I believe our own personal, my, my personal belief is that our fa fear and fascination with robots is, is very parallel to our, our attitudes toward immigrants and toward others more generally. The, this mix is, uh, is, is sort of a, a projection and, it's a, um, and, and can be thought of as a means to colonize or control in what Edward Said characterized in 1978 as Orientalism. And what we might now refer to as robo-Orientalism. So this is the tendency to in imagine, invent, project negative and overly positive attributes onto robots and AI, analogous to the cultural othering in ways that reinforce the old fears and stereotypes. So what we want to do next year is take apart this idea, robo-orientalism. You heard it here first, because I Googled it and nothing came up. So, uh, <laughs> so we're, we're, it's a problematic, uh, it's a conjecture, a sort of hypothesis. We don't know if, it's, uh, if it really holds or if, it's, if it gets traction, but we want, to, we want to talk about that next year. So we're already planning a series of, of talks on that, related to that subject. And then in the spirit of efficiency, um, we are going to launch this tonight with our speaker because his work exemplifies this very theme. Chico McMurtry is a consummate artist. He's a poet who works with the language of wood, rubber, steel, gears, computers, and motors to produce organic forms of trees, birds, and bodies. His subjects are the archetypes of nature, spirituality, and the human condition. Chico grew up in New Mexico, and he lived in Arizona, Los Angeles, here in the Bay Area, before he moved to Brooklyn. And he first exhibited in Japan, and has since shown almost everywhere in the world, from Australia and Brazil to Macedonia, Spain, France, and Poland. His work has been featured in solo shows every year for the past 30 years, and he's been recognized by major grants from the Guggenheim, the Warhol Foundation, the Rockefeller, as well as a number of prestigious awards. His latest project exemplifies robo-orientalism by focusing on a very contemporary dialectic between cultures, our collective fears and fascinations with the other, and on immigration, specifically situating a very massive poetic construction at one of our most contentious borders. Please welcome Chico McMurtry. OK. 
can. Thank you very much. Um, okay, how to start? Um, There's that word, um, amorphic robot works. How, uh, it all starts with how that came about. Um, my studio on Armstrong Street in, here in San Francisco, um, I was sort of trying to run a, an iron business to make a living, and I had uh, nicknamed it uh, Nalgeen Iron Works, which was, which was a funny name because um, I told my friend who was a local machinist about this limerick, uh, Chico Perico Nalgas de Wico. And, uh, and so he got Nalgas, he turned Nalgas into Nalguin. And so we, um, the, the Sharpie mark on my studio door was Nalguin Ironworks. And um, so in a second, I'll go back a little further. But what I wanted to just say is uh, the Bay Area was a wonderful place for me to be um, in you know, from the 80s uh, through the 90s, late 80s through the 90s. And, um, but well, anyways, it was, it was in 91 that Amorphic Robot Works was formed because after my period of time uh, working at the Exploratorium, um, I, I decided I needed to really create my own Exploratorium in my workshop, which meant basically creating an atmosphere where I could collaborate with uh, artists, engineers, poets, uh, playwrights, filmmakers. And so um, the word amorphic sort of evolved out of uh, anthropomorphic and or uh, the wear and tear that these sculptures endured. And as they endured more wear and tear, they tended to, to uh, erode and evolve very nicely. Um, so when they were new, they weren't quite as good as when they were older. And in fact, uh, a bit more anthropomorphic. Um, so uh, in the spirit of, of Ken's introduction, which was quite great, um, I just wanted to bring up this this first image. Um, I think I was I was quite inspired initially or influenced by sort of the moment of the end, like when when the end happens, when everything's gone, what emerges out of that, right? And so. This was uh, still taken from a series of early films that I, I uh, while I was an undergraduate, called Black Air. And this is this local junkyard, which was, you know, thanks to the heavy machinery and the amount of rubbish brought into the place, it really reminded me of that moment, that sort of a duende moment, that moment that kind of inspired my work for, for several years after that. So there's like these duende moments that come up every once in a while that carry you through a whole period of work. So um, in the meantime, what was happening, I was, I was studying um, movement, theater, dance, painting. Um, I just couldn't get enough of all these different medias that were available to me. And I was essentially searching for what, what, what is that medium I'm after? And I knew it had something to do with the way I felt in my physical body and it had something to do with uh, movement, and it had something to do with transformation. So um, this next image is from the, the Black Air series. And uh, in essence, I, I started to discover that the medium of paint didn't serve me well on a, on a canvas, on a, on a square. And so I found myself late at night past the time when everybody else kind of left the studio, I found myself um, uh, impaled with paint. And in fact, the paint on my sweaty body began to release. Uh, and there was this kind of a moment of, wow, this is, this is interesting. You know, this is in an interesting feeling. I, I can barely move, but when I do move, I'm also shedding. And then um, at one point, at one point, I started doing a series of performances which there's no images for, but I would shed these skins and these skins would remain alone and they'd catch the wind and those skins started to come alive for me. And it felt much more compelling than what I was going through in my own body because I, you know, it was, it was, it was a slightly uh, chilling feel, feeling. So fast forward up to 19, 
87, I arrive uh, in the back door of the Exploratorium, and these guys are like, what do you want? And I'm like, well, can I get some access to some tools and machines? And, and I, was, I was carrying this thing uh, around in the back of my Volkswagen van, and um, it hadn't quite taken a humanoid form, but uh, after they let me in the back door, I got access to a machine shop, and I gained sort of this tutelage under a fantastic engineer who all Bay Area artists know who are working in robotics or kinetics. His name's Dave Fleming. You hear Dave? Dave's not here. There's Vince. Works right next to Dave. So um, he was thrilled that this artist had come in the back door, and, and he wanted to help me um, get access to everything. And, and uh, they had a stockpile of, of uh, actuators, valves, you know, pneumatics. And um, he, was, he was excited to show me how to, you know, use the machine shop to, to adapt my ideas. And um, so this is the Tumbling Man. And um, it was born in the shop of the Exploratorium. And, and in essence, um, it was an idea that kind of follows me today, which is that... Um, I wanted to make a machine that was as awesome in force as these machines that had been ripping the earth apart, a backhoe, you know, uh, things of that nature. But yet, to express something quite genuinely simple, naive, and play-like, which was in fact to just tumble. So I wanted to make a tumbling man, so just wanted a machine to somersault. And um, once again, each time you're, you know, very simple idea, I want a machine to somersault. It took me, it was like a two-year adventure, which in fact was my, which was my PhD, really, ultimately. How do you get this thing to tumble? It taught me everything I needed to know. So, um, so onto this next image. So the tumbling man gave birth to a series of machines, uh, to 250 in total of these metallic machines. And there I am wearing the telemetry suit that I developed at the Exploratorium. And that suit, I would use that suit to teach the tumbling man how to tumble. So the, the gestures were directly, uh, you know, one, one led to a, a direct movement of that joint. And so what happened is I had to concentrate so hard to make the tumbling man tumble, I in fact looked more machine-like than the tumbling man. And uh, ironically, this is in Prague, and so I had a performance with the Tumbling Man and the Tycho Drummer. And the fascinating thing, and I wouldn't have brought this up, Ken, if you didn't mention that, but, but the Czechs know the word robot. They know it very well. So the children were, you know, egged on by their parents to go and pick up that Tumbling Man when it came time to take him away. So uh, before I could lift my hands after the performance, uh, six of these little children had picked up this 250-pound machine and took them away for me. They just kind of hovered the tumbling man, took them away, because they knew that this had something to do with their culture and their history. So, in fact, this robot was really an ancient being, um, you know. And um, in the performance series at the Exploratorium, the tumbling man breaks out of the earth and rips it apart. And the sound of the tumbling man ripping the earth apart was the beginning of this percussive a body of movement that, that came later, which you'll get a chance to see. Okay, so then fast forward from nine, uh, 1987 19, to 1990 to 94. Um, we, we, um, we had been working on a series of these machines that were musical, and this is, this is San Francisco's Theater Artaud, and this is Trigram, the Robotic Opera, Gosh, 94 or 96, I can't remember, but uh, so what we had is 15 humanoid, I mean human performers <laughs> engaging uh, my first six or eight uh, machines in, a, in an operatic performance that lasted over an hour. And there was an elaborate sound score performed by these musicians who at times would climb up into Rahula, the huge machine on the right, and there was a series of, of all the bone the bone sections were all percussive drums. There was a complete horn section in the body represented by the arteries. And, um, and then this is one of the performers playing the string body. This is Hannah Sims with the telemetry suit 
uh, performing uh, directly driving and uh, the string body, as well as sort of driving musical uh, sequences. So here is the walking legs, uh, better known as Joaquina Citroni. Uh, Joaquina Citroni was my first sort of uh, uh, air over oil walking machine. And, and certainly what happened while I was involved in this work is one thing naturally was taking me to the next. But I was thinking about balance, I was thinking about walking, I was thinking about falling, I was thinking about elegance, I was thinking about awkwardness. So this, this sort of trails back to my studies of martial arts. I was trying to figure out how can you keep a machine balanced while, um, and, and keeping it moving forward. So this machine plots an arc in order to move forward. So its feet are always on the ground and it creates sort of an arcing position. And as it does that, it's, it's able to move its hands very much very slowly. Um, and its feet, of course, were big enough that it wouldn't fall over. So uh, we reached this point in the year, we're going forward to two, the year 2000, and um, what would I do with all these machines? And I thought to myself, is there an opportunity to give them like a legitimate place to live? Where would this society of machines live if in fact I had an opportunity to give them a place to live? So um, this concept arose of the amorphic landscape which is this um, hydroelectric mechanical percussive machine that gives birth to all of the machines that I had talked about before in an hour-long sort of uh, epic performance that um, pushed the opera to a next level. Most importantly, it would allow audience to not be seated but have to move around the machines and. Um, um, and the machines, in fact, would guide them through the adventure. The, uh, the lower dwellers, there's the tumbling man, but also over here are the dog monkeys, which became a, a very important machine that would navigate the space and would um, attack the audience at their heels to move them on to the next location. <laughs> <clears throat> Therefore, you had a, a real a, a continuous flow. So, gosh, what's next? So, this next image, um, brings us kind of uh, around the bin to arriving in Brooklyn. So I moved from San Francisco in the year 2000. Rent had doubled. I think they wanted to triple my rent. So I'm like, well, I could be in New York if they're going to triple my rent in San Francisco. So um, I move out, and I find a super expensive studio in New York, which was horribly expensive. And uh, by a fortune, I, I was taken to this place called, um, well, we call it the Smoking Church of Amorphics, but it was an old Norwegian fisherman church. And the building was uh, pretty shattered, but it was available for a good price. So um, I moved into this place, and slowly uh, I was able to operate out of the place and make it my own studio, and a lot of stuff was able to happen there. Um, so, well, this is slightly romantic, but um, six years ago, was it six years ago? Um, all these machines were hanging out in, in, um, in Munich, Germany, and they were in three containers, and they had toured all over the place. And, and I got a call that the container was rotten, rotting, and, uh, you know, what to do about, isn't that going to destroy these machines? And then, um, well, I had, I had met Louise here before the child, and, and we decided to get married. And then I thought, well, if I'm going to get married, then we have to get married at least three times, because one time isn't practical. And so um, what ended up happening is, sorry to make this too long, but I invited my friend who's a Danish carpenter, and we decided we would restore this church back as close to the original church as we could. This is just a, a clip of it. Um, so um, this, this space, uh, Ken, you showed up to the church, right? So the church became um, 
a space for this uh, kind of like a performance museum of the machines from the past, of which you'll see there's several of them in this image. So I think I want to share with you um, a really nice uh, video made from uh, by no Noya House. Um, and Mr. Technician, can you roll that first video? It explains a lot. And, and cut the lights, that'd be great. If you were to take a scalpel and rip through the middle of my chest, my ribs would be catapulted outwards and all my organs would fly towards you, right? Can you guys picture that? When you're by yourself in a room, you know, you hear yourself breathing. You're really conscious of how alive you are as a human. I found that my work was focused on the most primitive aspects of being human. Those are the things that were intriguing to me. looking deeper into the way humans are made, started to become more of an investigation of sort of living things on a molecular level. Everything organic, if you look deep enough into it, it has a structure. Wait a minute, how am I built? How am I really built? I was interested in the idea of a humanoid machine that could stand up from a squatting position I would go in and out of my studio and there was a door dampener, which was a cylinder. I stripped that door dampener off of there and I set it up to the compressor. The thing literally threw me back because it had such strength. And I'm like, this is what I need. Not knowing what I'm doing, drawing a lot, figuring out the process, talking to people. Eventually, we got this machine to display a very sophisticated quality of gesture and it was the quality of gesture that I was after. It was a single important detail that I'd never seen before. That was to repeat itself. Each machine sort of the same process. One by one, they come into existence. One machine inspired the next, and I started seeing how they could fit in together. I had looked at these machines as a society. Me and my wife were going back and forth between Paris and here as we were dating. And at one point, it became obvious that we should get married. At that time, these machines had been stored for many years in Munich. This troop of over 50 machines had toured for a number of years throughout Europe, and their container was rotting, and these pieces were just rusting away. So I thought to myself, I'll restore them and have them perform the wedding. We managed to restore a lot of the robots' memories, a lot of their sequences. The most important part of making this kind of sculpture is the moment when the piece comes to life.
<clears throat> back to the Bay Area. Um, per perhaps some of you might have wandered across the Yerba Buena Gardens and had a chance to see this piece, which actually has been um, not functioning for a couple years because they, they've um, been expanding um, Moscone. Um, so this is uh, Urge, which, which evolved from that series of machines, and um, it's celebrating uh, 20 years of uh, running every day um, in the Yerba Buena Gardens, next to the Zeum and the Carousel and all that stuff. So a part of my trip here is, is um, uh, sort of engaging this restoration of this artwork. And so for, every, for everybody here who's actually built things and built things that move, and uh, one of the big things is like, how do you, you know, how do you keep these things alive or how do you design for something that will last for you know, a long period of time? And so, um, once again, uh, working with the team of people I had been involved with, um, there was certainly a, a group effort, but, but um, two, two, two years into it, um, we finally installed it, and, and um, it, it's, it's, it's performed very well. And uh, part of the idea was to take the whole thing apart and replace components, but it, it, was, in, it was in good shape after 20 years, actually. And so, it was suffering a little bit of, um, you know, loose knee and, bad elbow, just, just like me, bad elbow, loose knee. And um, anyways, um, if you get a chance, look for it, and uh, after April, it should be um, back and uh, functioning again. So um, the uh, earlier machines, um, this, whole, this whole notion of moving into the soft machine ha had a lot to do with um, thinking about duration of, of these machines, but also thinking about um, gesture and the subtlety of gesture and um, how, um, how to convince um, the audience that, that you were uh, after something really human, I think. Um, anyways, um, Urge, and then uh, following Urge was a piece called uh, Fetus to Man. And this work is essentially a clock, and it it documents the, the sort of the life cycle in the twelve hour cycle. And the idea is that twelve o'clock noon, um, this human form is standing at twelve o'clock, and um, as soon as uh, it passes the minute of twelve o'clock, it it turns and faces you uh, with its older half, and the older half um, is depicted as an old man and it descends down to six o'clock. And this is it slightly after six o'clock, but the old side, um, at, at six o'clock, it, it becomes a, a, the fetus again, and it, and, it's, and it flips over to the young side. So the young side ascends up to 12 o'clock, where it then flips to the old side. Um, and um, the very interesting part of the story is I had to go back to France and remove this piece because um, the mayor of that town forgot to uh, indicate that um, this was a Muslim community center it was being mounted on, and this is a piece of figurative art. And so it was, sto it was stoned a couple of times, and the second time the stone, the brick, size stone, was embedded in part of the mechanism, and and cause it to severely torque. So, so um, anyways, I made this move to go ahead and save it and remove it. It's been in storage ever since, and so waiting for it to politically settle down before we can find a new location in France for it. But, so it brings me to the next story, which I think is, is um, quite interesting. Uh, once again in France, uh, maybe some of you recognize this uh, classic automobile. This is the Citroen DS 1961. But in fact, it's not. It's a it's a, a depiction of it made out of a aluminum and um, a servo a servo linear actuators and uh, over 250 sensors and a dual redundant computing system to track where it's at at all times. And um, so we're gonna. I just wanted to show you guys this because I thought like um, Eric, Eric and Ken would want to see it. And, Maybe Cal, but and everybody else. But 
This is uh, the totem mobile when it's 60 feet tall. And on the right, uh, the security guard is saying, ooh la la, tre falique. <laughs> and, and so um, the, the totem was, was a super important piece of imagery that was, was, was going on in the work at the time. And um, what I was trying to do is I was trying to take this classic automobile and turn it into a, an organic object that was growing 60 feet tall and then descending back into an automobile again. And so if you arrive at the point when this thing is coming back down again, you have no idea that it's going to become an automobile again. And, and that's the sort of moment that I was after. So, um, can you roll uh, the second video? Thank you. 
while it's while it's becoming an automobile again, I just want to talk talk through a few details. So, um, th th this piece uh, actually was quite interesting because it represented a moment in time when I could pay all the people who had collaborated with me uh, all those years before. I think it was like 15 years before, and everything that we learned together was able to go into one thing. You know, and um, so. Um, the piece was commissioned for the car company Cit Citroën, but they sort of um, gave me artistic liberty. And uh, when I went to go visit this showroom, um, there was this giant blue scissor lift that was supposed to reach like 90 feet tall. It was blue. That's a really important point. So anyways, um, they told me to propose something. So I, I proposed it, and they went for it. So it was, it was pretty amazing. So um, I just remember working on this teeny little model and Geo Holmesy shows up. Some, some people in the room know who Geo Holmesy is. And um, he's like, man, that'll never work. And I'm like, well, let's do it then. And, uh, and so uh, um, what happened is um, there was this interesting period in San Francisco at the time. And there was this, um, he was working with Squid Lab at the time. And, um, so he, uh, I talked him into making a simulation of this so I could get the guy to give us the money. And um, uh, he, he worked with, with um, uh, one of the other fellows there and, and we got this, we got this uh, simulation together. And uh, so, so part of it is there's a huge, um, you can let the credits roll for a little bit. So, uh, my point is that two of these engineers who were also artists were working with me. Oops, no, no, not, not yet. Don't run that. Um, okay, thanks. I'll go back to the PowerPoint. So, um, okay. So, talking about permanent work. Okay, so the total bill was supposed to last like it was built to run for 20 years or something. No, no, go ahead and cut that video. We're done with that one. It was supposed to run for 20 years and um, it, it, it got pulled short out of the showroom. Uh, certainly, um, stop. Stop video. Um, it got pulled out of the showroom earlier than that. And um, um, hey, video guy, video guy, stop the video. Okay, so um, my point being that um, my friends who had worked with me on that project, we, we collaborated on a, on a huge um, call for, oh, uh, there was a call for art, and um, this is um, me, Gio Holmesy, and Bill Washaba, who were two of the engineers on the Totemobile, our proposal for an organograph, which was... Um, there was a call for a climate clock. Now, this, this already goes back several years before, um, you know, before the science was sort of reinforced and all of this. But basically, it, it, it was a, a work of art that was supposed to move forward in time for 100 years and, and plant a time trail garden uh, that had a color relationship. And the, the, the plants were incubated in the dome below. And in the rest of the five-story structure, there was basically a, a, a type of science museum that taught uh, people about um, the carbon cycle. And um, anyways, um, what happened next is we, we actually built, we built this model, and this is a scale model, it's like 11 feet tall, but um, it ran for w one year in the San Jose City Hall, and the idea was to prove that we could actually make this machine endure um, a hundred year cycle with a super low budget. In any case, uh, the project has not come to, um, to be yet, but um, I certainly was quite a f profoundly affected by that three year period that we, that we thought about what was going on with the climate and how do you, how do you like explain to the humanoids that inhabit the planet, how do you explain to them um, What's happening, you know, and how do you, how does an artwork um, help to teach that? That's what this was all about. So, anyways, 
um, this was supposed to last 100 years, which is, considering the sculpture ran for 20 years, it's, it's really a f kind of a frightening undertaking to consider something that could do that. But people are working on machines that will last 1,000 years now. So um, it's, it's, it's all very fascinating. But what I want to do is um, I want to turn back to this guy. So before the totemobile happened, this, this is called skeletal reflections. And um, that's him in the studio with all the technology exposed, but uh, I'm gonna bring you over to a cleaner version. This is, um, so the idea here was, um, I, I would say I was trying to push everything that had been learned prior to that. And what I was interested in is a machine that would subtly simply gesture. And the tie-in was, this is a humanoid form stripped of its skin to reveal the skeleton. And in fact, the skeleton of the musculature of our body. And so I definitely was deep in to the way in which we, we work and function all the way to the fingertip. And, um, you know, this is the year 2000 and like vision systems were just barely there. And working with several clever fellows trying to work out a system to, to have um, a camera look at an audience member. Audience member strikes a pose. We're asking the audience member to strike a pose that they remember from art history. So you, you've got, you know, there's a limited amount actually of the human figure in art history. And fortunately, uh, typical audience members don't really remember that many, so they strike something that we were bound to have in the library. So skeletal reflection throws down, you know, the crucifixion, or this might be part of Giovanni and his wife by uh, Albrecht Durer, um, et cetera, et cetera. But I reached this point of like, max. I had maxed out everything I could do. I was kind of maxed out. And I was like, what this thing doesn't do is it doesn't hold its flesh. Like Paul over here, Paul's holding his hand in his face like this, right? And he's just like melding, that face is melding into his hand. And that's like what I was really interested in. I was really interested in the way we are soft as humans. We're, we're, we're pliable. We've got bone structure and everything, but your character is not only made up of your bone, your character is also made up of your flesh. And the way your flesh gathers around your skin and your skin traps your flesh, etc. All that stuff. So... <laughs> I thought, I gotta make a departure from the machine that's metal, actuator, sensor, uh, and a whole bunch of computing, you know? That nice little, <laughs> that nice little uh, disc down there is full of all the stuff that makes this thing run. So um, here's the other moment that I was excited about. This is a little sketch in my sketchbook, and this was, um, gosh, quite, quite, quite a long time ago. And the sketch was really about, uh, I'm really interested in, in how to break down the human body in a, in a soft machine. And then off I go on this sort of adventure of how do, how do I make a soft machine? How do I make a, a, a bladder or something that holds air? How, you know, all this stuff was going on. Um, some of Eric's students, or is Eric? Yeah, some of your students were working on, like, they were today at this place where I was thinking about how do you do all this stuff? And a lot of people are, are thinking about that in a way, but so what happened was I couldn't make a humanoid yet. So I ended up making this, this first machine uh, was a, a walking machine, and there was, there was at this point still metal computing joints, valves on board, and then air going to it. And um, what I had discovered was a material that was related to um, high tensile sails that are used in the, um, the World Cup of sailing, for instance. So, so that's like taking, it's like thinking about carbon fiber in a way, really light and strong, but yet flexible. So it was this material that, that started this, what's been a 10 year uh, adventure. And at first, um, you know, the stuff was really difficult to work with and hard, hard to deal with. And um, 
So I was trying to figure out how to put together these structures in these machines, and I started doing really crazy things like casting screwable uh, spheres that are tapped with, you know, conical forms that hold the valves and the electronic, electronics run through the whole thing. And in the meantime, this thing is uh, 30 feet long and um, quite cumbersome. And, and it's still, actually still kind of heavy. Um, but what I learned a whole bunch about how to make these machines work and how to control them. And, um, uh, and how to get them to sort of begin to transform the shape of the space that they're in. Because um, what happened was that the, um, the machines uh, became a type of inflatable architecture for me. And um, so during this whole time, um, here's that drawing that I made that, that was sort of resembled the last image that you saw, but most importantly, what I was after was um, this kind of articulation, this ability for this thing to organize itself into a different kind of shape. Um, and I'm going to roll back. So before the last slide I showed you, I had, um, I arrive at this point where I'm making the first, I'm making these bladders that resemble muscles, and then I just kind of, um, find that the form, I didn't have to go after a human form, I, I, I could go after a form that was much simpler than a human form and still get something to happen. So this is an image of this piece called The Birds, where the birds are void of form, yet they have this kind of ghostly form. And th this, is, this is the birds kind of in full flight. And what happens here, You'll see a few excerpts of this, but what happens here is the birds, um, uh, they, they go through this life cycle. And at the same time, departing from just doing these full out performances with these metallic machines, I got involved in this notion of how can these machines just be self-contained, take care of themselves, be in a room, and uh, you walk in and at a given moment that you walk in, something's happening that will hold your attention as an audience member. So you would arrive at a different time uh, in the cycle of uh, this machine. Um, anybody have any idea how long I've been talking? Oh, yeah? Okay, so um, I better boogie a little bit. So, um, so what happened next was um, my interest in, in assembling these forms that not only um, related to architecture, but related to natural forms or natural formations. And I started thinking about, as in that video, how uh, everything that's um, organic ends up, you can break it down to a geometry. And so um, these are the inflatable architectural growths. And uh, I'm just gonna keep moving because there's some more videos. And so this is, a, this is um, a, a few of them in performance in China. And um, that's my daughter. And then um, this is a work that I built with students in Macedonia. Um, and so the other, the other thing I just wanted to mention is that um, so this, the collaboration with other people continues on. And, and my work takes me all over the world. And, the birds were developed in Australia. This piece was developed in Macedonia. And um, it's really interesting how you can bring these groups of individuals together and they can all find a way to participate. And the idea with this work was that it, it had a reference to being enveloped in a kind of a rib cage, but being inside of a sort of live, a live form, a live body. Um, and then this takes me back to an, a very early, an early form. This is called the hexagons. And, and, and literally, it was my very first muscle I had developed, and it's sort of, it's the shape of an urchin, but when you put eight urchins together, um, they behave like this um, kind of magnifying series of cellular structures. And uh, this piece was programmed um, to just 
continually change nonstop. And um, the idea is if you, if you find them in it, you, you, you just um, lay down underneath them and they, um, they continue to evolve until you go to sleep. Um, then um, another drawing of something that interested me, taking me all the way back to uh, the body again, was this notion of this kind of architectural structure that, uh, that can elevate the body, that can contain the body, that can crystallize the body, that can massage the body. So here it is, you know, looking a bit like a skirt, but when you, um, when someone, in this case, somebody else was controlling it, and they were able to control my body. So, as the as the performer in the suit, I had to let my body kind of go and rely on the person controlling the machine to not hurt me. And then, um, so the idea was, how do I? I was kind of thinking a lot about how to, how would this be able to survive in nature? This is just a, a drawing, but how would this kind of a structure, or how would these function as structures of architecture out in the open, and how could these things um, work with the wind and the sunlight? And, and then um, things got started to get a little bit more serious. I started to think about, <clears throat> can I c create this kind of... Um, architecture that, that an audience could engage engage and change the structure, be a part of what, what changes it, give it this ability to have multiple variables. And this is chrysalis um, with audience kind of hanging out and um, another view. And what I wanted to do was um, have the video guy roll the third video. Chrysalis is composed of 100 interconnecting high tensile fabric tubes that utilize amorphic robot works push to connect technology. The tubes are networked into 16 live sections and animated by compressed air via a servo controlled computer system. Each of these networks can be separately animated by the spectator's motion, which is constantly monitored by the integrated vision system. The vision system is made up of five cameras and multiple IR sensors. Once a participant is sensed close to the space, the central vision camera is activated. Sixteen sets of servo control valves form a closed loop network which regulates the flow of air. The air is directed through four master tubes which are attached to the winch motors. These arteries are controlled by driver boards equipped with pressure sensors. One of the winch motors also controls the z-axis responsible for lifting and lowering movements. The IR sensors track the audience movement controlling the expansion and retraction of the environment. As a viewer enters, the different sections push outwards, creating a pathway for him or her to enjoy the architecture from inside. Okay. Once fully inflated, chrysalis forms a 12 meter by 8 meter. My time is short. Um, so what I just wanted to uh, get to was that um, after all of these um, interconnecting tubes and all that was possible with that, I got, I fell across the next um, aspect in the work, which, which was this ability to um, literally put memory into this material and get these machines to do um, uh, a series of different things that would also envelop the audience. In this case, it's, this is this sort of tubular architectural structure that behaves uh, in it has a dual, a dual way of working, and that is that, it, um, that uh, it goes back into this very organic form, and then it transforms in front of, you know, that you're sort of, this is sort of hovering above you, and then before you know it, um, you're once again enveloped by, uh, by, the, by this architecture. And um, on the same note, it, it, uh, it forms these really, uh, there's all these really interesting shapes and things that you can do with this stuff. Uh, and you can stop it and start it and change it, turn it. Um, okay, 
let's, let's run this next video because it's in fact very short. So this, this is that environment um, in time lapse. Um, it's only like 20 seconds, but I just wanted to get you a, give you a feel as if you were walking through it. Um, So as your, oops, oops, I just played that. Oops, I don't want to do that. I want to go to this. Okay. Um, so of course, naturally, that took me to another place where I was able to really build uh, structures with these curvatures too. And um, so that brings me to the biomorphic wall, and um, and then segues naturally into this this drawing. This very important drawing. Which, which includes all of these things that you've seen so far in one, one kind of world. So it's like, there's this uh, 10 years of inflatables, and so my ambition always is to like, of course, turn it into one giant thing. And um, this is an image of Numa World in uh, Munich, uh, Germany. And in fact, it's, it's, it's uh, 10 years of machines in one room uh, set up in four days, which is, which is really hard to do, but at least it was a theater and there was a lot of hands and a lot of hoses to hook up. I'm not going to show you this video simply because um, uh, there's no time. And so I'm going to go back, I'm going to turn instead to um, the most recent project, which is called the Numa Fountain, commissioned originally for a monastery in, in uh, Austria. And this, in this case, it's shown in, in China. And... Um, what this is is a, it's a it's a, a a piece that ran for several months outdoors in a very humid environment, uh, and so we this was built to be able to endure uh, extreme um, rain and um, winds, and in the very middle of it, uh, you see this little stem that comes up. That's a, a special uh, sensor, a little propeller that that monitors the air and the wind. Uh, it doesn't like to perform very high. Uh, when it's over 10 miles an hour. So what it does is it retracts back to a safety, safe position before it, it, go, it goes up uh, higher. And um, this naturally seg segues me to another drawing, which is, which is basically a Photoshop, um, a Photoshop on top of the fence where I grew up in Naco, where I went to school in Nacos, Arizona, that borders Naco, Sonora, Mexico. And this fence um, was there at one point in, when I came back from college, and I think it was during Papa Bush's era. And Papa Bush decided to build a fence on the border with landing, map, landing mats from the, uh, um, the Vietnam era war. And so these things are literally, this, this scar on the beautiful landscape literally is like kludged together with chunks of metal and it spans this whole southwest border. So um, anyways, this, this, this idea emerges uh, 10 years ago and the idea, what I was interested in was making this very peaceful gesture that unifies both sides of the border through, through this action, this, this um, uh, these mach machines on both sides of the borders come together and form this arch, arch, arch form, which to me is like a symbol of peace, but not a ladder for people to climb over to get to the other side, but more sort of a symbol of touching the other side and, and coming back and gathering itself. So I'm rushing because I want to get to the video. So this is the first couple of uh, prototypes of, of that. And these early prototypes were quite light, and you can literally pick it up and carry it somewhere, but it was also quite big. While uh, this version was made um, in cooperation with uh, Joel Slayton, everybody knows Joel Slayton from uh, Zero One, and this was, this was um, I don't know, a few years ago when the Super Bowl was out here? Was it three years ago already? Four years ago, maybe. But um, this border crosser uh, turned out to be a little bit cumbersome because it's, it's um, 
17 feet wide, and it's not on a wheeled platform, and, and um, it doesn't actually get all the way, it's not, it's not very practically doing its thing getting over a fence. So um, a lot of redesign happens. So I start working on this idea of, um, can I make a series of these things more um, autonomous and rugged that can actually handle the kind of southwestern terrain and uh, navigate the terrain and get to the border and then uh, deploy. Um, so as I'm sort of researching this, more and more stuff starts to happen to my mind because um, I start thinking about, well, what are we what are we bordering? What are we cutting off? What are we sort of separating? What are we isolating? And it turns out we're isolating a whole bunch of different stuff. You know, in the background is is the border is Mexico, top Mexico. It's a bit polluted, a bit toxic. There's a whole crossover. There's a whole bunch of stuff being trapped from Mexico to America in relation to the level of toxicity in Mexico because we have no regulation, like we used to have, but we no longer have. And then on the, to the left is this beginning of a drawing of, of this future city, which was this idea about this future city coming up in Phoenix, Arizona. And the city is a little bit further back and isolated, but it's in the desert, and it's for people with a lot of money. And then over to the right is the desert station, the image of, of uh, Puerto Rico being devastated by like this hurricane and really nothing happening. Like it's supposed to be part of America, nothing's happening. And then and then over here in the foreground is this notion of these humongous piles of plastic that are gathering in the ocean and killing all the marine life, right? So it's like we're we're creating these compartments. And anyways, it, I go on thinking about that part. So here's the first model of the border crosser. Uh, next to my studio in Brooklyn and um, engaging some children. Um, and then uh, here it is en route to descending back into itself. And I'm still rushing to get to this video. So a year ago, um, I was invited to the University of Michigan and I was asked to engage students in engineering, robotics, and art in building one of these projects. And this is the border crosser in a um, sort of subdued state on its, on its autonomous vehicle and uh, before we deployed it. And then the next uh, slide is of the newest model of the border crosser in the, this is at the Angabante, the Academy of Applied Arts in Vienna. And me and the students from art, new media, and engineering got to uh, work on this one. And the difference is it, it coils kind of into a spiral form, then releases itself and propels itself forward into an arc, much different than the other one, but um, it allows me to go to the next video. Um, actually, this video should be number six. Can you do number six video guy? And skip four and five, head right to six. Right, thank you. I show up with my pickup truck in a trailer and uh, 
I asked him to put this on the back of my trailer. So we hauled it to the ranch on the border there where I grew up. And that's my friend Tom Phillips. Hey, Tom, are you in the house? Tom? Hey, Tom! That's Tom putting it back together again. And this is the first uh, trial run of the border crosser. This, this location was Mexico 100 years ago. ask questions. I think we're, we're, we're shy on time. We can keep this rolling, but people could ask questions as they like. Hello, everyone. Um, I am demonstrating our new Berkeley Center for New Media microphone. <coughs> um, it's nice and squishy, uh, just like the work we've seen. I'm going to test it out by asking uh, the first question, and then I'm going to ask you guys to uh, raise hands, and the ushers will bring this squishy friend to you. You need to talk like this. Not like this. Like this. OK? Um, so my first question is you know, from, from Klaus Oldenburg's uh, Lips, anti-war lipstick to ant farms inflatable on Sproul Plaza. There's a particular history of uh, inflatables and political art. Do you think uh, things that are, are inflatable are inherently political or have the, a different capacity to be political than things that are hard? That's my question. It's a great question. Um, uh, you know, um, I think uh, th there's a great, um, one of the inflatables are really great portable. Uh, they give you a lot of bounce for the buck for a quick moment. Like you could show up with a backpack and a blower and an extension cord and get a lot of volume filled quickly. 
and 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 of course you can shape that into a symbolic form. So yes, I think it's 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 for a particular reason. Um, portable, practical, big statement. Um, how often, like how how much? Can you tell talk a little bit more about your collaborations? Like how do you engage with people or with teams? I bet you have a process now. I'm guessing. Yeah, you guess I have a what now? A process in collaborating. Sure. Um, well, uh, actually, you know, the, the, the Border Crossers is an interesting example. I was uh, li literally invited to come and uh, design a, a course where I uh, work with the students to build one of these things. So you sort of set up a kind of a curriculum around it, and there's a whole bunch of stuff to learn. And then so you go through this whole process of learning for half of it, and then you rush to the end. So there's always a deadline that pushes things forward, and so in this case, that's how the last uh, three uh, three of these were built with students. And uh, more often than not, there's always a deadline, darn it, and uh, you'd think you'd get a lot more done if there wasn't deadlines, but deadlines are pretty important to keep the pace uh, going. And so um, the, the other rule is uh, anybody who wants to be involved can be and have been, and so... You just have to be energy, bring energy to the table, and you can learn something. And if you bring a skill, uh, what's great about that? If, if you're a programmer, let's say, uh, you get an opportunity to work on things you normally wouldn't work on, that are maybe perhaps quite opposite of what you would have been doing as a programmer. Sure. Hi. Um, Hi. You said earlier that the the blue crane at Sertran was really important. Oh yeah. And you didn't touch back. I was wondering why. Yeah. So. Um, the engineer, um, I, I put out a call for engineers when we were doing the total mobile, and uh, uh, an engineer uh, answered the call who had been designing um, redundant brake systems for Boeing, and um, he's like, yeah, I want to do this. And so a year later, he goes, you see those blue cranes? I designed those. So it's just this sort of interesting connection. Bill, Bill Washabaugh had been designing hydraulic lifts, and one of the ones in the Citroen showroom were one of his. Yes. Oops. Hi there. He's got the official mic. Oh, it's, it's on? Yeah. yeah. How do you ever interface with the explosion in R&D and robotics these days? How do I interface with the explosion? How do you keep up with it all? Because it, it's kind of <clears throat> going all over the place, isn't it? Yeah, sure is. Um, yeah, I think it's, well, it's, it's totally fascinating and it's also frightening. I was, you know, one of the things I was thinking about as I started to accumulate more of these machines was like, um, I was like, well, master control system controlling society of machines. And then I'm like, oh yeah, I got to get some money out of the bank machine. And then... Years later, you know, I'm like, oh yeah, they know where I've been getting my money, and so there's a path drawn. So it's just, it, it was, it, um, that's not addressing the point as much as something I was thinking about at the time. But um, I was going to say, Ken and Eric's students are like so like lucky, right? They can build anything that their minds can think of, and so the students going here are really, it's like, you know, 35 years ago, 40 years ago, um, it's just not the same. And, and it's a really outrageous time to be working in art and technology. I think it's a it's super, super great time. And there's some really important things to address. And I think the speed of these technologies and the acceleration of these technologies allow something to get out into the world quicker. And I think that's super important. And we need that to happen, like, right now. And so... If any of those students are here, you guys are under pressure. Yes? Ken? Uh, Chico, this is so great. I love, um, <clears throat> I had never seen that, that piece with the, uh, the citron uh -huh. unfolding. And I, 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 can't, I have to ask you, it's, um, were, it, was there any way that you were thinking of Kafka there? Because that, it just, I've never seen anything that looks so much like the, uh, what I would imagine that, that, uh, metamorphosis would look like. I was a fan, but I don't, you know, I think, I think, um, 
there's all this stuff floating around in your subconscious. And so how do you, you know, when it pokes out or not? Yeah. I mean, I kind of wanted it to be elegant and organic or, or convince you that it was that for a moment. But yet what happens is people interpret things in so many different ways. That's the favorite part of the process, to hear everybody's stories, how they, how they view and, and understand things, which is often different than what you thought about. But, I mean, that reference is there, Kafka. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Your earlier work, um, the movements of the human figures, uh, reminded me a lot of chickens because the movement is sort of jerky. Did you try and, um, was that intentional or could you not make it as smooth as humans move? I mean, we raised chickens. <laughs> When I was a kid, we raised chickens, uh, but but uh, no, I think it was just it was just you know on one level naivete or not having gotten to a point where they could be more elegant or in a way I was just finding myself lucky to be making things move, and then it evolved from real crude coarse things to more elegant things. I think and so, but the chicken foot is really amazing, right? It's like it's so skinny and so amazing what it can do and chickens for that matter are quite amazing if you really think about it but I wasn't thinking about chickens but they were in my subconscious <laughs> um, is this on yes good um, uh, my question kind of follows from that idea about gesture. And when you were first talking um, with the humanoid type machines and then moving to that wonderful opera with the dogs, there was something about following that arc of, of gesture from the human. And then when you moved on to Citroen and into the... Um, the border crossers. I'm, I'm curious with the change of materials, does that, all, does that also change this idea of gesture? And then they become more abstract, but it's still gesture. It's still dance in some ways. And what I began to notice is that you have a choreographic voice that goes and stops and goes and stops. And and so I'm curious if you followed your sort of ways of making things, whether they're from humans or animals or shapes, that is there something about gesture that keeps moving your machines? Fantastic question. Really good question. I, I think um, the voice stops and stalls. That, that, that indicates that I might be like spacing out a little bit in between. Uh, so... Yeah, so I think nobody really spaces out. They're just thinking about other things in between words, I think. Um, I think, um, you know, my early studies were in, in movement of the human body. And so um, my, my daughter here, who's watching video in the front seat, um, she calls those, she calls the border crossers elephant trees. And so, so she's like, you know, it's, it's a name that she came up with. And I'm like... That's always our reference, you know, she makes drawings of them and stuff like that, so um, they're, all of the inflatable architectural things, part of it is, is that I, um, if they're working well, you feel like you're inside of something that's alive, first of all, and then if it has that kind of human pace, then you might believe it more. So in, in the breath of it and the pace of the breath, um, does the sound almost become like a chant or does it become musical or I think th there remains a lot of the rhythmical aspects in the um, the newer work from the earlier work because I simply haven't abandoned working with breath I mean with air which is the same same thing breath air so there's this introduction of breath and air into all the work and um, some, somehow it, cap it captivates it brings you in more, I think. Sure. I just had a, sorry, up, is it working? I just had a quick, I had a really quick follow-up question to the gesture question. I mean, um, that was so, uh, I mean, it really speaks to the imagination that these border crossers, and I understand there are different versions, right? And I was just curious because um, 
there's such a sophisticated technology at the border that's all about surveillance and dehumanization and separation and containment. And it seems like what's so extraordinary about what you're doing is actually the melding of the animal, the technological, and the human to kind of, in fact, um, and the softness, the fleshiness of that crossing. So I was kind of curious about um, how you think about whether there were border crossers that had more of that organic human element, more anthropomorphic elements, more kind of machinic ones, um, and just how you're thinking about the, these border crossers as kind of like a, a, an alternative, reparative view of what borders, in fact, are doing. Wow. That, that was like a lot, a lot in one question. So. Um, Wow. I mean, one thing that's happened for sure is a lot of time has, has passed, right, thinking about it. And then certainly, you, I think if you build machines, you're often, you're often obsessed with how do you improve it all the time. So that's going on on one, on one hand. And on the other hand, you know, we've been scouting the border for a couple of years and looking for a little window of opportunity to sneak in and literally trying to have conversations with border patrol agents, you know, looking for an in. Like, how are you going to cross this border? How are you going to cross this border now if it's all, like, covered in razor wire? How are you going to cross this border if they decided to make it 25 feet, 35 feet tall instead of, you know, 12 feet tall, which it's been for years? And um, so... <laughs> <coughs> As a result of that, they've gone from like smaller to bigger, and if they get bigger to cross the bigger border, then you have to deal with all the bigger stuff and the size. And so um, it, it, it evolves, and then, and then what's really been evolving a lot is like the super importance of involving and, and in a way, giving an opportunity to collaborate with the natives of both sides, like getting getting the border crossers to literally be touched and built by the people on both sides of the border, by the communities that are like affected by this scar. I like to call it the scar. The scar across that beautiful landscape. The scar is, is blocking these families from being together, from sharing things. It's blocking wilderness. It's, it's not allowing the pollutions and the pollutants in Mexico to be exposed so that somebody can help those pollutants be controlled. You know. There's all these things going on. And at the same time, it's like you think about, is that really, you know, in a year we have an opportunity to cross the border. And will that opportunity really be there in a year? Or will it go away because of, you know, current politics? Um, so you're like, well, should we make it completely autonomous? So it just, you know, once you park the truck and you, and it, and it, guides its way out of the trailer, can it make it to the border on its own? Can it survive on its own? What happens if it's shot down by the militia? What happens if it's shot by the border patrol because there was no permission? What happens if there is permission and everybody backs out at the last minute because somebody might be insulted? You know, so all those things change the, the process for me. So it's a continual process of evolution. But, um, I think they're, they're, I'm just trying to find ways to get them to work better, I guess, while I have the time to do it. Well, um, process is a great note to end on. So um, thank you. Let's give a big round of applause to Chico for joining us tonight. <clears throat> Thanks for having me.